one rain at a time, I go, what do and do you not understand? And if I pick up a left rein, usually you can feel it straight away if a horse is not going to follow a left rein, no matter what, what speed you think you're going, what circle you want, um, you'll feel it. So basically, I don't have a desired direction I want to go, I don't have a desired pattern I want to ride, um, I don't have a straight line I want to ride, I just pick up on a rein and say, Oh, you're not very comfortable with that, are you? And I work on exactly that. So. Hello, welcome to Mark Langley's Horsemanship Podcast, a podcast helping people to understand their horses better, to provide solutions in a calm, connected way. I'm Jenny Barnes. And I'm Mark Langley. Today's questions are all ridden-based, from going to a new place and all the anxiety that comes with that to falling in and running for home. Mark is going to help give us his expert training advice. Mark, Heather has a nine-year-old Arab gelding, and she'd like to know if he is cut out to be a trail horse. She got him when he was six years old, and he was only ever in training to be a show horse, but he was never shown. Now, Heather does endurance with him, and she'd like to train him for it. But what she's found over the past three years of trail riding is that he is constantly looking around on the trail as if he's got a bit of a rubber neck. And it doesn't matter what she does, whether she tries correcting him or ignoring it, she hasn't been able to get on top of it. He will eat and drink on the trail, so she doesn't feel that he's uncomfortable, but she just feels very unnerved by the constant sort of looking around. Have you got any advice for her? Do you think he can ever be an endurance horse? I, I'm i not going to give you any uh, specific answer on can he ever be an endurance horse. Uh but I'm going to give you some hope in the sense that you can certainly help him become a little bit better at um, <clears throat> managing anxiety and letting go of certain things so he can regulate his own anxiety a bit more. Um, I come across this a lot in, in horses uh, that come to my clinics, especially in the sort of the hotter, more alert breeds. And, and in, the, uh, in the Arabs, you know, they're, they're very sensitive uh, they're very looky horses, you know, they, they sort of certainly observe their environment a lot, uh, notice a lot of things, things like that. Uh, and some, you know, can seem to have a form of what I call eye paranoia. And the eye paranoia is like, did you see that over there? I thought something moved, you know, or oh, someone's coming over there. What's that? What's that in the bushes? Uh, constantly like that. And that's probably what you're feeling, that eye paranoia. Um, and there's a horse I worked at at a clinic recently, which is a little Arab that's sort of, I guess, bred to be an endurance horse, but uh, out on trail, just just as always, constantly gazing and, and starting to get to a stage that it's, 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 it's got a really forward march, but looking at everything. And um, it took on the, on the second clinic, she did two clinics in a row, we started to make some really good headway with the horse to get it to really uh, centre and become calmer and start to just... Uh, be present in its own environment and just let go of all that sort of eye paranoia of gazing at everything. But it took quite a lot of work in uh, getting that horse to, you know, let go of strong thoughts. And that's the biggest thing you've got to look at. But something I will say for everybody who's listening, and and, and you may have some, uh, some of this with your horse in the past, he was trained to be a show horse. And sometimes those horses, when they're young, they go to these high uh, stimulant environments uh, and they don't have a lot of tools and then every outing becomes a sort of a, a quite a quite an anxious experience um, in the particular little Arab that I'm talking about the training that was done on that horse encouraged that horse to look for pressure so she'd practiced a few things where she'd you know put a stick here the horse moves off the stick and put a stick here and moves off the stick and until the horse in groundwork was so paranoid of looking for body language and sticks and stuff like that, that that only fed its anxiety when it's outside. So it's constantly looking for things moving when it's riding all the time. But in its groundwork, um, that, that sort of behaviour was fed through through looking for, you know, movements in people and sticks and all that sort of stuff. So some horses in their initial training when they're young, that type of uh, habit can be fed through the wrong sort of training where the horse is not present, not going towards his thoughts, it's just looking for pressure and where it's going to come from and the body language. So they're trained to use their eyes. So something in his past might have been, you know, and sometimes we, we sort of get the, the show Arabs to sort of poke their head up, not me, we, if people get them to poke their head up and, and do certain things, it could make them a little bit more attuned to being quite looky. Um, but either way, that's just, you know, something to think about for everybody when they're training their young horses 
you don't want to make them eye paranoid by looking for pressure all the time in your groundwork. Liberty horses can be a bit paranoid in, in, if they've done liberty in the wrong way, where they've got to look for body language, look for pressure where it's coming from all the time. And then that feeds into their, uh, into their you know, trail riding life and when they go out, they're constantly looking for things. So basically, to answer your question for your horses, you've got to take him back to a, an environment that's quite calm, that he doesn't have to look for a lot of stuff and figure out the basic tools that you use when you're out. Usually that's the left and right rein. Um, sometimes in the initial start, you might have to do something uh, like create a bang with a flag on your leg or something like that. Just stand with him. And when you see him gazing off and just looking, distract him, do something big enough to distract him, see if you can get that distraction. So he lets go of that, that thing that's that he's thinking about and then just wait on him and, and just keep doing that until he starts to not get caught up in all those other things but what will happen is he'll get more adjustable in his mind as, as in every time you do something small he'll adjust his thoughts and his thoughts will come back the first time you try it obviously sometimes their thoughts aren't adjustable and you can be jumping up and down and nothing's happening uh, and they're still gazing at something in the distance so you've got to do something big enough to get their thoughts so once you've done that uh, you kind of keep doing that a little bit until they become more adjustable and every time they come back into their own self they become more present you'll see him able to relax a little bit so you have to guarantee that that works before you even go out in a in a sort of um uh, a high stimulant environment so and you find a lot of horses that have you know a lot of people have the trouble that you're having with horses even in a fairly low-key environment their horses still look and you're still having trouble of getting them to let go of strong thoughts so get their mind adjustable first whether that be just standing on the ground banging your leg tap banging a flag or doing something once they're more adjustable then you when you're working them or you're riding them you pick up a rein and you hold the rein till they let go of a thought so if you if they've got a forward strong thought gazing at something you hold two reins and they back up until their thoughts let go of that and they soften and come back with their thoughts if they're looking to the right and you pick up a left rein you've got to stay with that left rein and until the horse finally softens an ear thinks into that rein and follows that rein that means they've let go of that thought. The more they do that, the more adjustable they become. When your horse is very adjustable, uh, then they start to become more centered and they stay in that state of present a lot longer instead of constantly hooking onto things off into the distance. Because it becomes a coping mechanism, something that they just do every day when they're out, then obviously that's all they do. It, you know, whatever habits we do each day, the habits that we do the next day. So you have to break those habits so by breaking those habits the horse gets more adjustable starts to manage its anxiety better because of letting go of strong thoughts and then you have a tool which is usually through the reins to say hey let go of that but when the horse starts letting go of those gazes they'll start to soften and and become uh they'll, they'll feel a lot better and, be, and become in a better place they'll they'll, they'll uh, and they'll just regulate a lot better and then yeah you just keep doing that but you might have to start small don't take them into new environments. Take them into a, a, an environment that they know and get really good at it And before you go advance uh, into uh, new environments. Something similar but maybe it's a little bit different is a question that's come through from Haley. She'd like to know tips with situational anxiety. So this is when the horse goes to a new environment or a new place and they get anxious. Is that the same sort of thing? Build those tools for connection first, then tap into them. Yes. So, so basically, and that's probably something I didn't uh, delve into too much on the on the on the, the question about the the, the Arab, but um, is the, the the stronger connection and the better leadership we offer our horses, the the the, the more confident they are of, of going into a new environment with us. So, basically, if you had a little herd and, and one of those horses was a really good kind of leader in that herd and that horse suddenly disappeared then the herd would be fractious and then someone else that's not so good might have to step up and they get all worried about it so being um a good calm person around your horse and having a connection where the horse feels safe with you is obviously doesn't matter on the ground under saddle that's super important in the equation uh if you don't have that then even if you get them to let go of a strong thought then because there's no allied comfort in there then it's still harder for the horse because they still feel a little isolated in that new environment so just for, for, for both these, these horses and situations, that, that's super important as well. But um, as I mentioned with the last horse, the more adjustable they become, the 
easy they are to let go of stronger thoughts and then that becomes like in my experience what i've seen uh all the horses that i've sort of that have had really really strong thoughts and i've managed to get them to let go of that after about 50 times of getting them to let go of, of a thought and take on a new thought they become very adjustable and then they start to regulate their own anxiety more because they let go of things themselves a lot more uh so you know um you know, so when your horse goes to a new environment, if it, you've got a good connection with it and you've made it pretty adjustable in the in how it lets go of things, then it's obviously in a better mind frame to deal with those things. Um, and and yeah, they become a lot better at going into new environments and feeling a lot better, or having tools to survive those new environments. So yeah, super super important. Um, but yeah, you just got to do enough of it and slowly because i think i think horses get scared of new environments because they know they've been in that environment before and felt helpless so that's why they anticipate that new environment because they've always felt helpless and anxious so once you can help them through a few medium environments then they and they center a bit more then they can cope with more intense environments because they've found softness in those environments and then the anticipation of those new new environments and the extra anxiety by feeling helpless is, is uh, reducing all the time. It's so reassuring to hear that um, horses that sort of have these quite strong behavioural characteristics or traits, um, you know, can learn and change. You know, we sort of forget that when we get stuck on something that's going wrong. You know, how is this ever going to get better? But actually, horses learn. They're fantastic, aren't they? They're really intelligent animals. They can really take on new information. It's just a case of making sure that this is they re they become these new habits, and it really is possible. Yeah. But just just for everybody to think about, um, you know, I'd, I'd like I, I I've always. I'm always a, a glass half full person, so I always, no, no matter what horse got sent to me over the years, I, I was always there to say I can make a change and help this horse. And it was through that positive thinking that I that I dug deep and, and tried to find answers instead of going, oh no, this is just one of those horses that's never gonna gonna get it or something like that. That that wasn't good enough for me. And I'm glad I, I thought like that because, as I say, digging deeper into my own mind and what resources I had um, at hand helped me find out that actually I, I could achieve or, or could get a horse into a better place that you know a lot of other people would have quit on and but I'm, I'm also going to be a realist as well and say that there are horses for courses and sometimes people want something like I said to someone at the last clinic I said you know this is going to be an okay horse for you for what you want to do just here but it'll never be a jumping horse it'll never be a cross-country horse this horse has been you know pretty cooked in the racing and, and you can help him become a soft horse but if you throw him into a high stress environment again the chance of you helping him is, is very very limited and I think there's there's too many horses out there that they'll soak up that environment a lot better than to use him as that one for that sort of thing so though she's mm -hmm. made great progress with that horse and helping become a soft horse we still have to be real in the sense of are we expecting too much from this horse uh, from the type of horse it is and also what it's been through in the past and is there still underlying triggers that may still happen it's just just too much for that horse just like people there's so many people that will suit certain jobs others won't suit that job at all um, and and I think we have to be mindful of that Carla's got a question too, a slightly concerning question. Oh, she's got an 18-year-old horse, not her horse, but one of her friends, who will just take off and run for home, unannounced, um, not frightened. He just seems to turn his head and go. And if someone's on his back, someone has been on his back, they straight into hospital. So she really wants to help. Um, and she knows that the owner of this horse wants to keep riding. But how can she do that? Yeah, not not it it uh, it is a a thing. I come I come across it in young horses that are getting started that are early in their career. I come across some that have older and 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 done a heap that it's still in them. Um, I'll give you a couple of little examples because I guess for the for the podcast listeners, it's good to hear a couple of little stories. There's a horse I help. I've been helping a little bit. It's a gypsy cob horse. Seems like a very quiet horse, and 
he's got that tendency to just tap out and hit the red line, but go from sort of what looks like a calm horse to hitting the red line and just kind of running off. So it ha started happening at the float and also under saddle that, you know, he'd just get to the float ramp and then just take off, pull out his hands and, and he'd just run back to where the other horses were, were and just stood there. He wasn't running away from humans in fear, he was just running back to safety. So I, I was on my way to a clinic and I helped to load this horse to, just to get to the clinic and uh, and we just put him in and he, and, and he felt to me like he gave some pretty soft soft change and, and I thought, yeah, he's good enough. He, he, you know, you've travelled him before, obviously, you know, da, da, da. I thought everything's okay. Put him on the float. About half a minute after we sort of closed the door and just he knew he was in on there as own before she got in the car and it goes to drive off, we hear this bang, bang, bang. Next minute he jumped over the chest bar tried to launch himself through the front window and he's all okay everything's fine so we traveled him with another horse because he was fine traveling with another horse but it just showed that even in my hands I felt he feels pretty good and he was listening he was thinking into the float he was processing it as he went everything felt good but then all of a sudden once he realized he was the only one in there then all of a sudden he hit he went from sort of nothing to to, to quite worried and and his his uh, lack of self-preservation in that was quite strong so and he was more the stoic colder breed like the gypsy cob style of horse and and so so we've been working on on him and and it, it it stems all the way back to him being a show gypsy cob and i believe never been shown the tools when he was younger thrown into the deep end and just you know doesn't really understand pressure as well as he should and um doesn't have the coping mechanisms and and he hasn't been softened through pressure to feel better so basically then he has this kind of tap out experience where he just goes i'm tapping out now and i'm off and he just does it out of the blue and another little horse i came across and this is going to be more the one that i'm going to link to to the the horse that you've got was a, a young girl came on a little quarter horse and he didn't look shut down but he looked like he he could shut out a lot um so basically you couldn't get him to go and everyone was saying spurs whip spurs whip get him going you know da, 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 all that sort of stuff and i said no if you can't get a horse to go you can't get him to stop so I said, don't, don't, don't get that idea of flogging them to go because one day he'll be going and he'll take off. And then his mum and, and the daughter said, well, actually, when he is going out on a circle somewhere, he's out there, he'll just suddenly take off for the gate that's open and then just head home, just take off out of the blue. And I said, well, yeah, that's that's the thing is um, because he won't go, he if, if he wants to stand still and dig his heels in at, at, at the gate at home and not want to go anywhere – then it's not laziness, it's just a horse that won't let go of a strong thought. So when he's going fast, he won't let go of that thought either. So that's the way you've got to look at it. So oh, I'd love you to do an experiment where you actually started where his anchor was, where, where his most favourite place is, and point him in the direction of away from that place, ask once for him to go and see if he'll keep going. And I bet you he won't. I bet you he's just going to hang around there and you've got to almost make him go. And he might be fairly compliant at following the legs out and fairly compliant at, yeah, I'm going out that way. But as soon as he gets overwhelmed and it could be a, he's like some of these horses, when they're overwhelmed, they don't look like the, you know, the hot Arab that's kind of like really, really overwhelmed, but still goes, does a whole endurance ride. They're just looking like they're fairly calm and then all of a sudden they tap out and run off. So they're the horses that kind of, they build up, but they internalize it more. So when it gets to a head, it doesn't look like it's, uh, on the outside as emotional as a horse that's really out there so what I want you to think about is I bet you he's anchored at home and I reckon if you sat on him and said I'd like you to go that way he's going to go no but if you rode him that way he'd go that way because he knows the pressure pushes him that way so this all goes back to the good one range start and a good one range starts in good steering so you've got to have patience for this and if you don't have patience for this I'd say to everyone then you're going to quit in an hour. Uh, and someone says, well, I haven't got my horse to move in an hour. You know, I said, well, it's taken 10 years to get that horse to bolt. So, so, you know, we're not going anywhere, are we? So, you know, what's a couple of hours? So what I mean is like, I'll sit on a horse for half an hour just, and I'll, I'll sit at the area where that horse likes to be and, and wait until it knows how to follow a rein left and right and follow that rein softly because I don't have anywhere else to go. Because if my horse doesn't follow a rein softly, I don't need to go anywhere. I don't want to be out in the paddock and find out that it bolts. So uh, there is no cocktail bar anywhere else for me. The, the cocktail bar's right here underneath me, the horse uh, and the brace and what the horse doesn't understand. So 
So I'd sit on that horse quietly and I'd just say, hey, follow that rein, let go of a strong thought. And when that horse can follow the rein around soft one way and the other, and he starts to let go of the idea that his mates are there, then you point out in a new direction and he might start to crawl out in a new direction until he can find lots of new directions that you're not pushing him on and he's searching and he's thinking. And then when he goes out 50 metres, ride him back to these mates and say, good, look, you took me out, I'll take you home. And I, and I say this to everyone on young horses that haven't been ridden before, that were ridden a lot, this is the way I'd do it. Is, and I'd do it with the old horses that, that, you know, that run off sometimes when they're out, is they've got to take you out. And you'll find there's a lot of brace you can find in the reins and the things that you need to get a horse back before you even get out there by teaching them to follow the reins. So people get impatient is because the more the horse wants to stay at the yards, the more the person wants to be further away. And that's when I say, hey, look over there. Can you see a cocktail bar? No, there's no cocktail bar, so don't even worry about thinking over there. The brace is right here. Follow the rein here. And when that horse can follow softly, they'll start to search out a bit. But if you're using your legs to push them out and you've got to push them out like that a bit, and even though they're so, it's subtle and you've still got to steer them and keep them in line, you're kind of pushing them out. And when you take that all away, they're going to just go back to the yards anyway. So I say they've got to take me out. And I want you to really think about that. Uh, and I reckon you'll find that if you sat there quietly on him, he'd go, oh, they're sitting here in a loose rain. I'm just going to turn back around. Uh, and while ever they're still doing that, well, when they get a big load of worry out there, well, they're just going to turn back around and run off. So, so really think about that. You mentioned spurs in, in your answer to that, um, just briefly in that um, question. And I've got the next, the next question from Janita, and she has been riding her eight-year-old Andalusian mare for about two years in English or dressage style. But she's finding that when she rides on the left rein, she falls in. She's tried correcting with her inside leg and she's just found that she's sort of got worse. Maybe she's scared of the outside arena perimeter. She's flexed outwards. She really doesn't want to use spurs if she can help it. She's finding that spurs are going to be one of the last things she wants to resort to. Um, can you just give us some tips of how she might be able to help with this shoulder that's falling in? Just by the question, uh, the question I'm, I'm getting the impression that... Um, I think in your mind, you, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but I, I get the feeling that you might be thinking, I'm wanting to ride this arc and my horse is not on the same arc as, as I want. So to get that shape, I want more inside bend and get the horse like this. You did say, Mark, having... that she wants her to walk straight instead of counter flexed. Yeah, okay, so and that's it. You want the horse to walk straight. Whatever we want, we have to put out of our mind and assess, I think, really what the horse needs. And by the sounds of what your horse is doing, um, it's got a, and by the sounds of it, it's, it's quite strong to the right, as in, as in its primary focus is going through its right eye and counter flexing there, looking to the right. And I come across a lot of horses that when they're carrying a certain amount of anxiety, they are, have strong thoughts out one of their eyes more than another and some horses are more wary with that eye of all the things and stimulants that like you said around the arena it could be pushing off the arena having to look at all that stuff so and that's why i say we don't want to be riding what we want we want to figure out what the horse needs and by the sounds i think the horse needs to one learn how to steer better but also you've got to figure out is what's its dominant eye and how much anxiety is it carrying from other stimulants like your legs and things like that so so i think what you've got to look at is when i squeeze my legs on the horse and it goes it goes with a bit of worry and it goes oh i'm worried and it starts to draw through that right eye that could be something you want to go back and look at and work on how well does my horse accelerate now this is not fixing i'm not going to really go into the detail of fixing acceleration i'm just saying they could be one of the key things that cause the horse's anxiety to go up to make it worry and either you know, push through uh, or, or draw through its, its, its more confident eye. Um, but I'm going to talk more about the steering. And so basically when I sit on a horse that is crooked, uh, whether it be through anxiety, whatever, um, I just pick up on the reins one rein at a time. I go, what do and do you not understand? 
and if I pick up a left rein, usually you can feel it straight away if a horse is not going to follow a left rein, no matter what, what speed you think you're going, what circle you want, um, you'll feel it. So basically, I don't have a desired direction I want to go, I don't have a desired pattern I want to ride, um, I don't have a straight line I want to ride, I just pick up on a rein and say, oh, you're not very comfortable with that, are you? And I work on exactly that. So, so you know, I'd say you'd be picking up on that left rein and finding the horses starting to block that left rein as soon as you lift it up and put a feel through it. So that's why I teach a lot of horses to lead through a rein before I squeeze them up into a rein. So basically I've got to pick up on a left rein, the horse flicks its ears, softens its thoughts to the left and says, I would like to go left. And then by wanting to go left, it loosens up the jaw, looks into the turn and follows that rein. And you might have to sit there for quite a while and do a lot of transitions just picking up on the left rein and the horse just lets go of a right thought and rewarding that. So that means instead of the horse just flicking ear, because some horses will flick an ear back and go, gotcha, but it'll still be focused out that right eye. Well, I'm not happy with flicking an ear and saying I've noticed the rein, but I still want to look over there. I want it to let go of the right thought. So I'd be picking up the left rein till the horse lets go of the right thought and keep doing that until it lets go and then you say now you've let go of the right thought so you put a feel through it the horse lets go of the right thought then it's to the left then you say lead to the left and you might draw that rein open a bit and lift a bit and see if it wants to lead into that turn and I know I would work until the horse can lead into the left rein lead into the right rein equally nice and soft once you've got that leading into a rein established the horse is getting more comfortable but there's also it's become more adjustable by letting go of the strong thought and then you just start to add different rein positions in there. So once a horse can softly lead into the left rein, where you can actually pick up that bend that the horse has already got by looking into the turn, bend a bit more, get it to move its hindquarter over by picking the rein up into your middle and lifting up. Um, but, you know, once upon a time I used to use an inside leg to fix that, you know, like you think, do I have to put a, a leg on or you didn't want to go to a spur or something, but I used to put a leg on and make a horse bend around my leg and then I realised, why am I fixing... A rein problem with my legs because the horse actually started the problem when I picked up the rein and I thought well I can't fix a rein problem with my legs I've got to fix a rein problem with the reins it's just kind of bypassing the problem that the horse actually blocks out as soon as I touch the rein so yeah don't have anywhere you want to go just get the horse to think softly left think softly right and then start to advance the rein positions where you can get the horse to bend and lift out. So the next thing, you know, apart from the hindquarter yield that I'd do is I'd, I'd pick up the rein up in the middle of the neck and get that width to lift up and across a little bit. Um, but you don't have to do perfect arcs and things like that. you just got to get the horse to turn. And this is a good saying that I say to everybody. And I, and I see this happening, like you go to pony club, you go to adult rider club, people, you give them people a bit of flat ground, they start to do circles and figure of eights and they kind of got this horse on this set sort of pattern that they got to ride like the horse is a mode of transport. And, and I, I, I got a saying that I say, go out and teach your horse how to turn, come back and show me one perfect circle. Don't do a thousand circles to try and teach your house, horse how to do one perfect circle. So basically once a horse can follow a rein, the only person that has to know the circle is you because if a horse can steer correctly it'll steer wherever you steer it so just teach your horse how to steer don't have any desired direction just figure out where it doesn't understand something teach it how to steer and then later on go back to do your you know whatever circle you want but by that time you should be able to drop the reins go in a straight line pick up a rein the horse can steer um, on the straight lines if we use the reins to correct a straight line, then we're constantly correcting the horse and using the left and right rein to make it go straight, which means the horse is not going to steer so well. So I hang my reins and just let the horse go straight, and then I pick up a rein to steer it for a fair while until the horse is really good at knowing that straight, straight, pick up a rein means steer. If you steer, use your steering reins to straighten a horse, then you're wasting the steering and, and the horse won't steer so well. So you've got to look at that as well. Um, but I've had a lot of horses, one in particular, which I'll just quickly tell you about, which is an older horse by now, it's about 20. I sat on that horse at a standstill and it took so long to get it to think into that left rein that by the time it started to think into the left rein, it was getting the sweats and we haven't even gone anywhere. We weren't even going fast, we were just waiting. And then it finally, like the first thing it could do was flick an ear and let go of the right thought, but as soon as it put a twitch of movement through its body, bang, thoughts went back through the right eye because I think it had spent its whole life 
thinking that safety's out there somewhere and had never actually committed to a rain and said, let go of that outside thought, follow the rain, you're not going to die. And the horse finally let go of that thought at a standstill and then it finally could pick up its foot. But as soon as that foot placed, the thoughts went back to the right. And then at about the 45th minute, the horse went, I can pick up a foot and place it and I haven't thought to the right. And then it sort of had a big kind of lick and chew and let a lot of tension out. But that's, I had to stop and go to another lesson. But when I came in the next day, well, the lady rode it in and this horse floated to the left. And I said, just ask for a trot. The horse just did this perfect trot to the left. And I went and just looked happy. It wasn't searching to the outside, looking for safety. It had almost said, I've, I've given myself to the rain and I haven't died and I feel safe and I don't have to destinate anymore. And I think that horse had always destinated through its right eye never actually finally committed properly to the left and now when I watch the horse it actually turns a lot better to the left and you've got to work on the right a bit more but it's not destinating it's so much more present so much so much um, more into the conversation and carrying normal amounts of anxiety instead of kind of I'm just tense and I'm going around doing the right thing and so for the horse letting go and thinking of that rain was life-changing in the sense of trusting the pressure of the reins. And I, and I think for horses, we've just got to look at it like that. We're helping that horse, uh, empowering it by getting it to trust the feel of a rein and not think that rain is a trap. So many things to consider. It's, it's, um, it's quite, quite incredible. Thank you for all your tips, Mark. I hope that helps with all the questions um, that have come through from our members for this week. We'll talk to you again soon, Mark. You can learn specific training from Mark's unique horsemanship through his online training videos. Take a look, marklangley.com.au. Make real progress and lasting change, helping your horse's emotional well-being in the process. It's the sort of stuff that will make you think, but it's going to build your skills enormously. There are over 500 training videos, a challenge series walking you through, and support. Delve in with the free seven-day trial. Membership starts if you want to continue at just 20 Australian dollars a month and you get to ask Mark a question. Thanks for supporting the work he does.